to the State of Mind podcast. My name is Mike Stroh. In this episode, the dignity effect, social emotional living, and unity focused peacemaking with Naya Abernathy, the founder of the dignity effect. We cover a lot of uh, deeply meaningful and you might say emotional uh, topics. Um, she is from Georgia in the United States, the state of Georgia. And so I think we have a lovely conversation about the, the blend or the mix between dignity, um, what it means to live a meaningful life, how we can bring in characteristics and values um, that help move our global community in the direction of a common humanity and, and how we can look towards each other and to the future with hope because right now in today's world that is sur surely lacking, I think. I think you'll really enjoy it. There's a lot of soul food in here. And uh, Naya really shares so beautifully from the heart. She's got a ton of wisdom. I think you really like it. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Uh, yeah. My name is, like you said, Naya Abernathy. I'm the founder of The Dignity Effect. And uh, in my work, I focus on social emotional living and unity oriented peacemaking. So I do that through a variety of channels. Um, I do custom curriculum for companies that are looking for how to kind of structure their learning around the needs of their um, audience. And uh, you can also find me on Instagram posting and like giving resources, pointing you towards different directions um, in spaces and to people who really uh, honor the dignity of uh, people different people and um, communities um, that you may be around. And so my goal really is to encourage people to see dignity in themselves first and then be able to look out into their families and their community and in the world and see dignity in others as well and then engage them based on that. That's lovely. Um, and you're also you have a five month old and a three year old, yeah. Uh, which, yeah, yeah, which adds to just everything that everybody, I guess, goes through. I love, I love the idea of dignity. I think I probably have said this to you in the past, but you know, one of my favorite mindfulness teachers says, always sort of says, sit in a posture that embodies dignity. And then he goes on to say, whenever that word is mentioned, it almost um, lights some sort of impulse in us, you know, that like we just carry ourselves a little more confidently or with dignity, I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, can you expand on that a bit more maybe and why that's so important and also in terms of what you said about seeing other people or mm -hmm. sort of carrying ourselves with that first with the self, but then in others, and how that leads to more cohesive communities and societies. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll give you, I would like to start with my definition of dignity, uh, which is the God-given intrinsic worth and value each person carries that cannot be taken away. Mm -hmm. And so when you, um, and, and really, if you break the definition down, the point is for people to understand that dignity is not something that I give you or that comes from um, somebody, uh, another human that you're in a relationship with. It comes from like a higher source and uh, it is intrinsic. You cannot earn it or lose it. And, it, and no one can take it from you. Uh, people might try to cover it up or make you forget about it or never tell you about it, but it's still there. Um, and a lot of times it's there waiting to be discovered. And so uh, the dignity effect is when I discover it in myself and then I look up from looking inside and see that same light, that same spark in the people right in front of me. Usually the, the first people you're thinking about are your loved ones. 
usually your family doesn't always have to be your family um and then you start to see it in maybe acquaintances and strangers until you go all the way out to the other side of the spectrum and you can even see it in your enemies and that's kind of the ultimate um for me is the ultimate uh or the furthest point that dignity reaches not that you agree with your enemies not that you excuse uh your enemies um actions but that you can still humanize them in light of what they have done or not done uh, and then engage with them based on the fact that they too hold dignity just like you do and it really changes the way that you interact with people that you love people that you know people who are like who are not like you people who you disagree with people who you don't understand people who you're not interested in understanding people who have hurt you it really gives a different way to navigate through that those realities of relationships um when you say i'm gonna make dignity primary and you can't do that in someone else until you do it in yourself first and then the ripple effect can happen and if the ripple effect doesn't happen then that's not dignity whatever you are honoring in yourself isn't dignity unless you are compelled to see it in other people because that that's it's it's almost synergistic like you can't have one without the other it's both always yeah yeah that's nice yeah i think oh there's so many uh the first thing i want to park maybe till later is this seeing it in an enemy or someone that we don't like or disagree with to me it sort of relates to the idea of loving kindness and i think it's a little different but sort of starting with ourselves and as the circle expands. Um, and I love how you pointed out, you know, it doesn't mean that we don't disagree or not even like the person or enemy or et cetera. Um, and cause we can hold both of those. And I think, wow, what a lesson that would be for all the difficult social issues that are going on in the world right yeah. now. Uh, yeah, um, for sure. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, can you maybe like share a bit of your own personal journey through human suffering and into where you are now? I think I'd love to hear yeah. that. Yeah, Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say my journey really started off as primarily a mental health uh, journey where I found myself probably my early 20s is when I really kind of woke up and started paying attention to the reality of my mental health issues. Um, I was dealing with, uh, and at the moment, I probably knew it as much as I had language for, which at that time was not, I didn't have much language at all around um, mental wellness, but, uh, you know, would later find out that I was dealing with a very interesting mix of anxiety, depression, and eating disorder, um, mild OCD, and, uh, you know, topped off with a, you know, fresh coat of perfectionism. And it was just a, <laughs> it was a mess. Um, and I remember uh, getting to this point where I was so, I was hurting so much. Um, and I'm a person of faith, and faith in something greater than yourself is supposed to create this sense of hope in your life, right? And I didn't have that. Um, and I kept thinking up until that point, I didn't have that for a long time, really. Um, and up until that point, I thought it was me. I'm like, I'm doing something wrong. Um, I'm doing something to, uh, is this, can you hear me okay? Cause it's a little I can, yeah, but maybe if you pull it down and is the mic on your, uh... Is that the is, mic? Is this better? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that's better. It's better? Okay, okay. cool. <laughs> Thanks. Um, no problem. It's just getting windy. So I wanted to make sure you weren't hearing like gushes of wind in the mic. Yeah, no, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I thought it was me and it, and I really was leaning into for years was leaning into this try harder, do better, bootstrapping, all of that mess. And the hurt 
got to be so much. And I felt like I had literally tried everything I could that I got to a moment where I was like, this is not the way I want to live. I don't think this is what life is supposed to look like. Even what I believe about life and about God and about people and relationships, it doesn't match up with where I'm at. And I don't know what else to do except reach out to somebody who I haven't reached out to yet, which <laughs> at that point was a therapist to try and go uh, inquire on the mental health side of like, is there something else going on? Which I was very reluctant. That whole, all leading up to that time was around 22, 23. And even when I started, I was kind of like, you're not going to say anything. Like, it's still me, right? You know? Um, and that really was the journey that I started to not just unpack the mental health issues, but also realize that I had spiritual health issues and I had emotional health issues. And um, just that that whole person was suffering. Uh, my, my whole person was suffering in these, these various areas. And, you know, now I can look back on myself at that age and feel a lot of compassion. But at the time I was really angry because I felt like, I should not be in this space. Um, and that anger eventually turned to kind of a sorrow and a grief. And then that moved into a space of um, compassion and kindness uh, and, and patience in the healing process. And out of all of that, what I, what I mined out of that experience was kind of the gold nugget of dignity like this really is the issue and not just for me but I was watching other people that I knew that I worked with um I I during kind of like my mental health journey um I was working a lot with families families at risk families uh affected by addiction families in uh, family health services with open cases and things like that. And I kind of saw these similar issues and heard these similar things. And I started, uh, coupled with therapy, um, try to be intentional about the community that I had around me, the, the relationships that I was building, um, read a lot. Uh, this is before I knew about podcasts, or I would have been listening to a lot more podcasts too, but I was doing a lot of reading and really landed at this space of dignity that says like there is value in each of us and we don't pay enough attention to that. We pay more attention to our mistakes, where we fall short, how we don't feel good. We put the mask on so that we could be accepted. Renee Brown talks about hustling for your worthiness. This is how we live, but like that's not, that's so outside of who we who we've been built to be and so to me every time I want to talk about someone's wellness or their journey or who they are I always always want to make the starting point dignity not you know something else uh, that kind of puts people at a deficit so for instance um, I know I didn't really think it was a deficit because this situation was worked out really well on paper though so I grew up in a single parent household and that would put me quote unquote at a deficit like from jump before I've even like you know shown up and done anything right or wrong but before that part of my story the foundational part is dignity and so if I start the story there then the narrative changes a little bit um and and for me, like, it, it really wasn't a, you know, when you come off of paper and you look at my actual life and my actual story, that wasn't a, a barrier to me being successful or to me feeling loved. Like, that in and of itself was not an issue. But for a lot of people, you can see that that, that can contribute to some other things that, are, that make life difficult. And kind of the theory or the wondering that I carry around in my head is like, even with these things that we can say like this, certain factors make people's lives hard. 
if we could and would be willing to make dignity primary, would those results be the same? Because the other thing that I found is that I, I dealt with at-risk families who did not have some of those same struggles and who were in a place where uh, they did experience more um, togetherness and connection and things like that. And the family who on paper might look like they should be doing great. Two-parent household, um, you know, incomes at this level, you know, 2.5 kids, picket yard, you know, pick, you know, picket fence, everybody's educated, everybody has access to everything. And these families are suffering in ways that seem to not fit what they've built. And again, that's, that's really kind of what I found is that um, when you don't, when you don't engage with dignity first, the outside stuff doesn't really matter, right? Like it could be perfect or it could be terrible, but that engagement and that establishment and that focus on dignity can really adjust how you move through whatever your circumstances are. Um, and so a lot of the, the focus that I have kind of put energy into is around the family and saying, how can, how can we create space and engage in our familiar relationships differently so that dignity is honored in spaces where traditionally that's not, it, it hasn't been done that way. Hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, okay. I got to try to organize my fleeting thoughts, <laughs> like go so many directions. Um, I think, yeah, stay on the mental health tip for a second. So when mm -hmm. you were, experiencing sort of that distress mm -hmm. like in your early 20s mm -hmm. how did you find help or was it through like uh school friends family mm -hmm. um work like what because i think a, a lot of people also just don't know like where to go or how to do that even though it seems yeah. simple you know it's like yeah yeah just call this person um, yeah, <laughs> right. here's a resource, call the number. And you're like, but then what do I say when I call? So yeah, it can, <laughs> for someone who's starting at like ground zero, right? It can yeah. feel very yeah. like overwhelming. Yeah. So the, I, it was very, it was kind of a roundabout way. I was, I could feel myself in a not good place. I was being very resistant to anything outside of what I was doing, quote unquote, or trying to be better at. And I'd attended a conference. And I really, and, and it was a, it's a, it was a faith-based conference. And I really felt like in that conference, God was calling me to like rest in grace, which I was like, yeah, I get it in my head. But on the inside, I was like, no, no, we have to keep working to make sure that we're okay. Um, and and in that conference, they had some sort of resource, a counseling resource. And so that was the first, that was my first experience, like voluntarily going to therapy and saying, okay, I'm showing up and trying to work on whatever this thing is that I don't even know what it is. Um, so it was a little situational, but I was also like in a place where it had gotten bad enough where I was like, I know I really still need help. And... I'm just going to try this because I haven't tried it yet. I'm just going to try it, you know? Mm -hmm. And at first it was, it was just a good space to start talking about what was going on. Like I didn't want, like now I'm very comfortable with therapy and I will walk in um, and be like, here's all, here's the history and blah, blah, blah. Let's talk. And this is what's going on. Can we talk about, and I just want to do the deep dive. Cause like, you don't, I don't need like the, three sessions of getting to know you. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Let's just, it's fine. I'm good. Let's just move past that, you know? But then, yeah. but at that time, uh, I was still very trepidatious and um, it was a slow move into it. But what started happening was there were things that I started considering um, and questioning that I wasn't willing to consider and question before. 
And that started happening in a therapist's office with someone who was willing to go very slow and let me open up as much as I wanted to and put up the wall when I needed to put up the wall and still try to engage with me through that. And so um, I think the first, and, and even before that, there were people in close near me in my community that I would talk to about how I was feeling, but it was always through this lens of like, but I'm not doing this good enough. I feel this way and I need to be doing better as opposed to just stating like, this is what's going on and, and I don't like it and I don't know what to do. And I'm not even sure how open I am to doing something different. Like so much of it was just level setting and taking, taking the mask down just enough to like peek over the top and say, is it, is it safe? Um, that's the beginning of it, right? And yeah. somebody allows you to do that. And I think the key with having a therapist is it wasn't somebody I had a relationship with who I was like, oh, you have to, you're going to be nice to me and you're going to tell me it's going to be okay. You're going to tell me how great I am because you're in relationship with me. This person has no, like, there, there's no incentive for them to be like, oh, it's, it's okay. And that's not how therapy works anyway. So I could go into this space with somebody who was neutral who could like be with me in those moments. And I felt like you don't, ha you can tell me if I'm a terrible person and you will, and then I have to deal with that. But that's not what came out. So I was like, so wait, I'm not terrible, <laughs> but now what? Cause that's what I thought. I thought I was just awful. And she was like, well, why? And I'm like, because I am. And she's like, well, let's talk about that. You know? Um, <laughs> so, so much of it was space making. So much of it was, mm. you know, and I didn't know, right? I was trying to peek over the top of the mask, but so much was of it was that, like, is it safe? Someone said, yes, it is. And then I kept the mask here, like right below my eyes for a long time. Like, all right, but I don't really know because. <laughs> um, and then as the journey went on, I started to, you know, get more vulnerable and learn about authenticity and i had certain experiences with being vulnerable and authentic that i was like oh this is great i didn't necessarily feel great i was still hurting but the <laughs> process of being able to be that way and still being yeah. accepted and still being told like oh yeah you can okay this is great like i'm not gonna call the cops on you because you know you feel like i should or you think you're a terrible person and then you're gonna you know whatever um here's what you can do between now and the next time we meet. Uh, I'm going to let you go so you can get to the grocery store and like do normal things in life. And, and that was, that was helpful because I started to very slowly, I started to become integrated, right? Where it wasn't, mm. here's the life that I put on for the outside world. So I, so it looks like I'm okay. And here's my internal life, which is a hot steaming dumpster fire. Like that's what it feels like. It's, how does it look to integrate that? And as it integrates, the dumpster fire gets smaller because things start to make, you start to sort some stuff out. Um, and then the things that you were hiding start to come to the front and you realize like, I don't have to hide all this stuff because everybody has stuff. Yeah. That's nice. I love the... <laughs> sort of the mask analogy too is so nice. Like, is it safe? No, I'm going to go back and hide or like yeah. just, so that's like really nice. Uh, Cause that kind of really, it's almost like the part of us that's kind of hurt and scared and hiding. And it, my, um, my supervisor for my like uh, psychotherapy placement always says, we're in the shame reduction business. And shame likes to hide. And so we're trying to, we're always just trying to bring shame out of hiding. It's sort of that, it stuck with me so much. And so kind of, it's kind of like this hiding thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, there was something else you said too that I found to be, okay, doesn't matter. I was wanted it, to. Was it the dumpster fire? 
Well, yeah, it was like, <laughs> <laughs> that was good, man. That was good. Like, like, yeah, let's go with that because yeah, I think, oh, and then you, and you said integrated too, because part of it is, yeah, yeah we're kind of so fragmented in some sense or, I mean, we are a collection of personalities too, in some weird way. And, and the more they operate at least somewhat together, I think the better we are, sort of are in some sense, because we're not trying to hide any part of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's, I love, okay, so there's a couple of things I wanted to talk about too, as you were describing, I think sort of before that experience of like working your way through um, therapy, but also in your professional work with families and stuff, kind of the, this idea of like our higher selves or our, you know, our divinity or our, whatever the words are, you know? Um, Yeah, it is quite, well, it seems to be absent from a lot of, uh, I guess you could say like psychotherapeutic theories and and treatments and et cetera, or whatever. Um, And I I think we talked about this in the past, something that's, because you worked with a lot of families or people in in addiction recovery or substance use recovery. Um, And one of the beautiful things I think, at least, you know, personally, but also when I see it in others about like Alcoholics Anonymous or the 12 step process is that it really at its core is about restoring people's dignity, you know, like there's, and I'm like getting goosebumps even saying it. Um, and that for me was so, it was like I had stomped on every, on the, on my higher self, right. Or on the divinity within me out of fear and out of grasping and needing to use and da da da. Um, and as I slowly, so actually, here's a great question. I don't know. I, this probably a lifelong unanswerable question maybe, but <laughs> Let's do it. okay. Awesome. So, and, and you mentioned it earlier, how do we, so if that sort of, if that, that part of myself that is always dignified or deserving of dignity is always there. It's almost as if, why couldn't I ever honor it? Or why is it so hard for us to, like what happens there? And then, and then how do we kind of help it emerge or, or sort of, I don't know. I don't know. Is that kind of a, it's not a direct question necessarily, but yeah, if that part's always there, sort of what's the, how does it get covered up and like, what are some ways you see it emerge in yourself or in people you've worked with? Sure. Uh, The short answer I think is narrative. So the narratives Mm -hmm. that we tell ourselves, the narratives that we allow others to tell us, especially when we're children, we don't, have like if I were if I were awful to my children uh, Mm -hmm. and said you are and and let me let me say differently because this is some stuff that parents do parents who love their children so much do this oh god it's so stupid oh please get away from me I can't that creates a narrative when you speak to your children that way when your nonverbal interaction with your children reinforces the fact that they're in the way that they get on your nerves all the time. Sometimes they do get on your nerves and that's yeah. valid. I'm not saying we have to walk around and be like, you're my perfect angels all the time. But if no matter what, they're just, you're always annoyed, irritated. Um, don't, don't really want to spend time with them. You're, and as somebody who is, I'm like a type A personality, I'm like, give me the checklist and let's get all the things done. Um, it can be very easy for me if I'm not paying attention to be like, get up, eat your breakfast, we're gonna do this, you gotta do your letters, then this is, we're gonna go outside, blah, blah, blah. And it's never about, mommy, will you come play with me? 
and saying, yes, I will come play with you. I will put down whatever I think is so important. And when you ask me to come be in your space and in your imagination and to make memories with you, I'm going to honor that. It is so easy for us as adults to say that is not important. What's more important is I got to cook, clean, do this work. Because again, I'm going to throw a reference to Brene Brown. We as adults don't honor our own desire to play and our own desire to rest and our own desire to be creative, right? So when that is the narrative in which our children live, there is no space for their dignity to emerge. We don't mm -hmm. give voice to that value and worth in them. We don't give space to that value and worth in them in their own homes. And so how do they go out there in the world as they grow up then and, and say, I can take up space. I have value and worth if they're not getting it from us. There's something else. There's, a, there's another narrative there that shrouds the dignity. Uh, and it's the narrative of, I need to be small and stay out of the way. Or I need to be loud to, so that I can be heard because that's the only way I'm gonna, my voice is going to be heard. Or um, I need to do something extraordinary or be really smart. Or um, you don't want to look at me because you're disappointed in me. Um, or, or anytime I get upset, I need to make sure that I, in, instead of uh, making peace, I need to make sure that I keep peace. Because if I do anything to upset anybody, they don't want me, love me, I'm not valued. And we do that in so many ways because when we parent, we're not thinking about what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We are taking what we've seen and what we've experienced and just recycling it instead of saying, doing our own work and saying, what was it that I didn't get that I needed? And how can I provide that to my children as I move forward? And if you don't have kids, even if you don't have your own children, a lot of people have children in some capacity in their lives. How can I do that for the, the children in my life? And how can I do that for the relationships that I currently have as I'm working on myself, as I am growing into the person who does honor their own dignity? Where can I call out in another dear soul's life or in their narrative and in their story? oh, this is where I see your dignity. This is where I see your divinity. Wow, this is really great. I love this about you. Hey, it's okay for you to take a break. Um, mm. If it's somebody that you, um, like if you work with someone and the only way that you connect is via work, a way to honor their dignity might be, hey, let's get together, not around work stuff and just chat and get to know each other and laugh a little bit. These are ways that we start pointing people to see their own value and worth when it is covered up usually by said dumpster fire. It's covered up by that. That's how we start to put the flames out. And that's how we start to move the rubble away and say, here it is. Here's the worth and value that has always been there. And I'm so, so sorry that your parents, your people in your family, people in your community, your society, your, your uh, place of worship, your uh, ki kids in your classroom, your coaches, your teachers did not honor it. And not only didn't honor it or ignored it, but actually spoke against it and acted against it. I'm so sorry that you went out into society and they would not respect this value and worth that is inside of you, but, but I'm pointing to it. And I hope that we built relationship enough so that when I point to it, you trust me and you believe what I'm showing you. Um, that's what it can look like when you do it with an adult, but it, the way you do it with uh, the, the way that you ensure that the next generation doesn't have to have a dumpster fire sitting on top of their dignity is that you start in the beginning paying attention to how you engage with them because children are full people. They're not adults, but they are, they come into the world as full people and respecting that reality, I think can help shift how we engage with children and how as parents, we start to have a desire and a taste to parent the heart instead of parenting for compliance, to parent out of hope instead of parenting out of fear.
And those are the distinctions and how we make sure that we um, honor the dignity in the ones that are coming after us. Um, how about, so how do, in that, I, where I'm, I get, maybe where my own dumpster fire confuses me is, and I'm just curious your thoughts are, so when we act in ways that dishonor the, our own dignity and those of maybe our kids or friends. Like, how do you work with that? Like, what's the, because I, I, and I, selfishly, I'm thinking of even this morning. So, you know, my son behaves in a way that's not okay. I get angry and I say something. I just use a word that's not, a great word to use, <laughs> yeah. but the intention of like, so this is again, where I really struggle. It's because what I'm saying is true in terms of like mm -hmm. what he's doing is not acceptable, but the way that I deliver it is not okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not an example of the person I want to be. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So when we act, you know, out of our ideal. Yeah, how do we, you know, I'm just curious, like what your thought is on, on that and like what, what a process is um, to soothe that or to heal that or whatever. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing that we as adults with children or towards children have to think about and really towards other adults too but especially towards children <laughs> is um our willingness to apologize and to really own in front of them how we have not shown up well for them and that that's not the way we want it to be and that we're still working on it there's so much vulnerability in that and it gives them permission then to show up and not be perfect and ask you for forgiveness and say, hey dad, I need help with this. Because if we constantly interact with them from a space of I'm right, I'm the authority, um, maybe I did this wrong, but I'm gonna throw this like, ha like half of a not really apology at you and then move on because I'm too prideful to admit to a child that I did not make a good decision in the way that I related to you that's problematic and if we think that the child is going to learn to do something other than that same thing then we're fooling ourselves because they're not they're going to be like oh that's how you deal with it okay got it clearly not like it's subconscious but that's what yeah, we're yeah, teaching yeah. them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so and i think there is freedom in saying hey i was wrong I still want to talk about the behavior, but the way I approached you in my behavior, that wasn't good either. Now I have a three-year-old, your uh, son is eight. So I have to talk in very like simple terms and like it, we don't get into really deep conversations, but we have those conversations. And I might reflect back to her something that we've talked about or something that she's learned or uh, the way that we usually interact or whatever. Um, and sometimes she gets it and sometimes she doesn't. I think the other part is not about, you know, sometimes it's not about them getting it in the moment. Sometimes it's about the process that the two of you go through. And that's really what the important thing is, right? Is the process that we're going through building relationship and a, and a, re a relationship that honors both of our dignities so that when this eight year old is an adult, I can have an adult child who I have an appropriate friendship with because how many kids grow up to be adults and are not concerned about whatever relationship they do or don't have with their parents or the relationship is very like it's not deep um but the people who you know the longest and possibly possibly could be the most intimate with are your parents because of just the dynamics of a parent-child relationship and living together and all these other things. And that's a beautiful prospect to think that I could be in relationship with you now 
as, as a parent to a child that blossoms into something where I am, where you are an adult and I honor that space and our relationship evolves into something that is closer to a very intimate friendship that honors dignity, that has authenticity, vulnerability, and empathy, where I can step back and say, I'm going to let you make these whatever decisions because you are an adult, and where you are able to push back and say, hey, dad, I, I don't, I didn't like this, or can we talk about this because this isn't working for me anymore. I know we used to do it like this, but can we, that's a beautiful possibility. And it doesn't happen because you did everything right. It happens by you moving through the relationship with humility, which really is about you knowing who you are and being clear about the fact that like there were no mistakes made when you were given this child, like you're supposed to be this child's parent. Um, and and it's not a bad thing, and it's actually a good thing for your son to watch you struggle with how to relate to him sometimes because then it gives him permission to do the same thing and it just be human. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my answer. <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. Um, just, I'm feeling the tingles in my body. <laughs> um, yeah, there's it's something so, I uh, just gotta like allow, um, yeah, it's just nice to hear, like, it was very eloquent, I guess you could say, just everything you kind of described. Um, we do have this, I guess one thing that I, I think, so, God, I'm stumbling over my words because I don't know where to go. Um, I, I'm comforted almost that to hear you sort of describe it that way, I think, I do think we've done a pretty good job of trying to adhere to like a lot of what you said. So allow like struggling in real time with him in person. Um, and I think in all relate difficult relationships or difficult moments in relationships, when we can struggle through them with humility and grace, or just the willingness to kind of be wrong and or accept bad beha like bad behavior in yourself, um, and not get too caught in that. Um, uh, on that note, God, we've been having a lot of these moments lately, <laughs> so it's like we have <laughs> one nice thing that has been good for us is like all the things that I've learned in my own healing journey, and then also that I'm like teaching or even helping my own clients through is these mm -hmm. stressful they're kind of these moment calendars basically so one is stressful communications like uh, one is unpleasant pleasant moments so one of our recent not so great moments was a fight over the Nintendo controller. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> so ridiculous. Life. Yeah. Let's, no, let's talk about it for oh, real. That's God. real. Yeah. So yeah. Um, you know he refused to give player one controller to his sister, and this is about this is literally I can I can accept any all the normal kid behavior or human behavior that is annoying, like hopefully will mature out of people, whatever. Um, I can handle that no problem. Where I just lose it is on this sort of boundary violation of like, no, no, your selfish needs don't get to interfere with your sister's like Frickin' divinity or dignity of like getting the player one controller she gets a turn too and like i right. don't like i will fight that to the end um 
but then again, it's like, how do I respond to that? And I'm not responding well. So, so anyway, we have a lot of practice of like going through these like therapy sheets together, which is cool. Right. So he's, <laughs> yeah. so we start writing down. It's like, what happened? Michael and Oliver, uh, fought over player one controller. And it's like, um, like what specifically happened and then it was like Michael yelled at Oliver and Jamie was there too while we were doing this it was so funny and then I was like okay so what did Oliver do next and then Oliver was like I called my dad a stupid shithead jerk or something like that <laughs> and and <laughs> as I'm typing it out together the three of us just like burst into laughter you know and it was like it was like such a nice freeing moment to like at least mm -hmm. allow yeah. a little bit of space. It's like, we both know the way we speak to each other is not okay in those moments, but at least we can mm -hmm. kind of like pull back and laugh at it. Um, and so yeah. hopefully that is part of the modeling as well. Cause you mentioned that too. It's like the modeling around, which I, I also agree with is super duper important. And because we can, mo I mean, I think I'm because I guess I'm also trained in sort of the non judgmental loving awareness of like the practices of mindfulness. I find it very hard because the second I get into the judging and that this is bad, you're bad, you know, it's all going to be bad, everyone's going to be, you know, it's like I get really unhealthy really quickly. So, mm -hmm. like psychologically or spiritually. Um, so that's sort of how, how we try to work through those things. And I, I'm curious, so you meant uh, about, I think one thing that I do tr have been trying to steer him towards is that sense of dignity. Like, so when I ask him, or when he's being sincere about something he's having a hard time with, I'm, I try to say, cause he likes Star Wars and and so he understands the good side, like the darkness and the light. He gets it for sure. And he can see it inside himself. And so I'm, I'm sort of, because I also, I relate that to dignity in some sense, right? Like the God-given divinity of, of, I don't know, dignity or whatever the <laughs> word is. Uh, yeah. And yeah, so I guess my question is, what what do you think about the balance between like explicitly saying you are not or i don't think you are behaving in in that in that place of the light side of the force or like, you are a dignified human spirit and being and you're not you're not honoring that part of yourself or maybe you can think about honoring that part of yourself more so that you don't choose to do what you did um, so that would be very explicit. And I don't know, like if it just goes in one ear and out the other, or just, it's just like, I always think of this Homer Simpson, uh, this episode in the Simpsons where Marge was lecturing Homer and all you see is Homer being like, blah, 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 blah. You know, it's just like noise. <laughs> oh my God. And, and, yeah. So then sometimes I'm like, God, what am I even doing? What? And then. Ah, so that balance between like explicitly saying you, I want you to honor your higher self or I need to honor his higher self or something like that. And as opposed mm -hmm. to tell him what to think or do. It's definitely both. And, um, and so what you are talking about when you, t <laughs> when you talk about, said it so wonderfully <laughs> i think about charlie brown wow the teacher of wah, 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 and charlie brown nobody knows what the teacher is saying other than apparently the children in the cartoon but um that same kind of like yeah. is what i'm saying even landing anywhere like are you actually listening to me i think people are listening children and adults i think people are listening even when we think they're not I think people are, are hearing us sometimes even when they don't think they're hearing us. In that process where you say, I'm gonna commit 
to speaking to that dignity and calling that dignity out, it's, it's, it's definitely, um, it's an act of faith and it's the same, it's seed planting. So when the farmer goes out and puts seed in the ground, I'm going to put the seed in. I don't know what's going to grow, but I'm going to put it in and I'm going to cultivate the ground I'm, and I'm going to prepare for a harvest because I believe that if I put the seed in, every single seed might not sprout, but some of those seeds are going to sprout. And so if that's how we approach our relationships, whether they're relationships with our, relationships with our children, with our spouse, with our sibling, with our parents, uh, with our friends at work, um, relationships within the community. Uh, some people plant seeds when they put a post on the internet and say, I don't know who's going to see this. Um, there, there's a, it's, it's usually followed by something funny, uh, but there's kind of a phrase that people use when they post it. I don't know who needs to read this today, but, you know, and then they'll say something funny. Um, but it's that kind of sense of like, I don't know who needs this, but I'm going to put it out there because I believe in the process of seed planting. We have to, you don't have to do anything. It's important for us to take a posture of commitment to the work whatever that work is. I'm gonna be committed to the work even if I don't get to see the seed sprout, even if I don't get the fruit of my seed planting, I'm going to be committed to seed planting because it's an act of faith that I believe will yield a harvest, if not for me, for the person who received the seed or for the people and the future who will, you know, get to experience the results of that, I'm going to be an active participant in creating a better world by doing this in this moment and th with this one relationship. And I think that, I mean, it ties directly back to dignity because dignity says it isn't just about you and how you feel about yourself and even just about you and how you feel about others in the world. It's about other people also having the opportunity to, to realize and engage with their own dignity and then turn that outward and see it in others and then those people seeing it in themselves and then turn it outward. That's the ripple effect. And so if, if I get discouraged because the first time or the second time or the third time or the fourth time I put the seed out, I only, there was only a couple few sprouts or, you know, I, I only got a few ripples. I'm just not going to do it because that's clearly not working. Mm -hmm. Then we won't do the work that pushes the whole thing forward. It's a lot of the little things, right? It's not, the big and splashy is a part of it, but most of the work, it's the small stuff that you do day to day week to week, month to month, season to season. Um, a friend of mine, uh, Christy, has this, I'm, I'm not going to say the story completely right, so I'm going to try and like, you know, get the gist of it, but um, one of her favorite stories is um, of a boy who walks along the seashore throwing sea sh um, starfish back into the ocean that have washed up on the shore. And somebody comes up to him and said, what are you doing? And like, I'm putting starfish back in the ocean. The person's like, there's a whole ocean. What difference is it gonna make? What difference are you gonna make throwing these, you know, starfish? And the boy throws a starfish and said, makes a difference to that one. And he throws the next one and said, made a difference to that one. And if all of us had that like posture around calling out dignity, then everybody, would be able to hear about their own dignity and have the opportunity to trust it and engage with it. If everybody said, I'm gonna take my space of contact and community and influence, and I don't mean influence like Instagram, I mean the people who will listen to you, and I'm going to do this seed planting work and trust that even if I don't see it, that the seeds I plant, they're gonna 
something's going to grow and what grows is going to be good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I have, it's very difficult to guide people to like, it takes, I think it takes faith in some sense to have to, to do that. I, or for people that, you know, sometimes someone might say, you know, I, 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 I don't like what I'm doing in my life or I have no, there's no inspiration. There's no this because for many people that's tied to an outcome, right? Or the splash, I think you said, right? Or the, you know, the flashing lights or the object or the material gain, um, which again, yeah, like there's there's value in that too. But when we can set our sights on the seed planting or on the next right thing, the next step, that's where the magic is. And it's very, yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, the only way I learned that, I guess, was through surrender, having to surrender um, and then follow the steps kind of thing, which are spiritual uh, program. Um, yeah, that's a hard one to communicate, I guess, right? Like the, what do they say? Uh, it's the journey, not the destination. Like it's so easy to say these words, right? But to really yeah. own that and to really, I don't know. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a, hard. Yeah, yeah. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard to, to, it's hard to do the work and not see the results or not see the result you expected, or not see the result in the time that you thought you would, or I put the seed in and I did the fertilizer and I I covered it with the, with the net so the birds wouldn't get to it and then I weeded around it and it still didn't do, you know, that's, that's hard. I, yeah, I say yeah. when, when we talk about honoring dignity, when I talk about making dignity primary in your relationships, I'm saying it and it's hard and it's worth it. It's mm-hmm. all of those things at the same time. And I think, especially in Western culture, we have a hard time with the both ends. We have a hard time not either oring something and saying it's either this or it's that and saying there's gray and there's growth and there's change and there's mystery. And I could feel four or five things that seem to contradict all at the same time about the same thing. And I'm not crazy and I'm not bad and I'm not wrong. That's just where I'm at and that's okay. We're not good at that. And it takes faith and it takes hope to say, I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna do it again. I'm going to still go pull the weeds. I'm still going to, you know, I'm, I'm still going to till the soil. I'm still going to do all of these things. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I don't know if you've ever gardened, but when I was, um, my grandfather was a gardener. My mom keeps a herb garden. Um, and for a short period when I was working in addiction recovery, there was an on-site garden that clearly whoever owned the property before had like a fully functioning garden. Like they had a compost area and they had great beds, like they had fruit trees. I'm like, this wasn't like an accidental, like experimental garden. Like you were trying to, you're trying to grow some food. And I remember, you know, going back there I'm from the South, uh, you know, I'm in the Southeast part of the United States, which one of the uh, major crops is okra. I do not like okra. I don't want nothing with okra in it, no thanks. Um, but among other things, I think I, I planted, I had gotten some okra, I had gotten some, uh, you know, squash. I don't think we got watermelon. There were beans, uh, there was muscadines all kinds of things that I intentionally planted and there's fruit trees that just like came to life and would bear just this delicious fruit. It was amazing. 
but I remember, I don't remember which crop, but one of the crops that I planted that I really wanted to see like harvest from just did not. I was like, I did the things for us to have squash, but you know what grew in utter abundance? Guess, guess what grew in utter abundance? <laughs> Okra? Is that what it is? The okra! The okra! <laughs> I was like, I can't with all this okra! <laughs> um, uh, so good. And, and here's the other side of it. In the midst of me being frustrated about, and, and kind of sad about not having the harvest from what I wanted, and then having to deal with this massive amount of okra, the things that I didn't plant, that somebody else planted before me, the muscadines and the fruit trees bore this delicious fruit. And I literally didn't have to do anything but wait. I just had to wait until it was time for the fruit to come forth. So in this one garden, I had all these experiences and all these emotions about this garden. And it's such a picture of our relationship. There are things that people planted in a person or in a community years before us that we are going to get to enjoy the fruit of. There's some stuff that we are gonna try and plant and it's not going to come up. We're gonna have to go back and try it again and shift and adjust and pivot and figure something different out. And there's some stuff that you're like, I put like two of these in and there's an entire row of this one thing and I don't know what to do with it. Um, but there are plenty of people who do like ogre. So if I don't like okra, <laughs> I can harvest that okra and then give it to the neighbor who says, oh, I'm going to fry all this okra. And I'm like, honey, have, have at it because I don't want none of it. Do whatever you want with it. So there's so many gifts from being in this space where we are paying attention and being intentional about sowing that hope and that faith into our relationships, knowing that what is going to come up even if it's not always exactly what we want at the time that we want, man, it's going to be what we need. And a lot of times it's also what somebody else needs that we didn't have the forethought for, but it's going to be there. It's beautiful how it works. It is very spiritual. Um, it is, yeah. And I think us just committing to the work is, the committing to the work is the biggest is the biggest step. And remembering that in the commitment, there there has to be space for rest. The ground has to rest. You have to rest. You can't right, work right, all right. the time. Um, and you have to be able to enjoy uh, to what you what you are receiving from the garden. Yeah, it's lovely. Um, okay, maybe because we are getting on in time too, and I want to. I'm curious. Um, I'm not sure I was aware of before you said the work about, um, unity around the unity stuff. Unity what do you mean by that? Peacemaking. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, and also, did you see, I assume you did because I made it up to Canada, although social media gets all over the world, obviously, but, um, when killer Mike made that, speech on the news and he just kept saying plot plan strategize organize something i can't remember um mm -hmm. but i thought that was such a beautiful display of honesty and like like he was he was embodying the idea of i don't necessarily have the answers but he was like honoring his anger and his sadness and his mm -hmm. hope and it, all these things at the same time mm -hmm. it was really okay. lovely um and so, yeah, like, how does, how do we, you know, the, the personal dignity, communal dignity, um, planting, because a lot of what he was saying, I think, speaks to the idea of we can't get lost in being tied to an outcome now mm -hmm. kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like that list of things he kept repeating was in some sense the work of planting the mm -hmm. seeds. Um, yeah, and so so the the unity the peace use unity peacemaking sorry unity gonna, oriented peacemaking thank you thank you <laughs> uh, yeah how, can you can you sort of string those things together does that sort of make sense yeah yeah, yeah I think I can um, that is actually 
a little new for me as far as putting it in word. I think art has been there for a long time. Um, but I actually kind of like got a little quiet in June as far as like what I what I'm doing with the dignity effect, especially like in social media or um, as I'm doing my writing and how am I engaging with people, inspiring people and educating people, encouraging people. Um, and kind of what came out of my tapping, which also coincided not unintentionally with, uh, you know, the racial revolution that's happening in America and really it's happening all over the world now. Uh, is as we talk about racial justice. So as so I take I took took a like quieted myself a little bit. This the racial revolution really like amped up after I decided to do it. Um, and so I'd been really thinking about what does it look like for me to be talking about and educating and encouraging people in dignity right now. Um, like what do people need to be hearing um, and learning? And through to not, I take 12, 15 minutes to talk about it in detail, but the short of it is I made peace with the reality that I operate in a peacemaking space. Like I desire to be someone who doesn't keep the peace, keeping the status quo, but someone who creates space and opportunities and insists on peace in places where uh, peace has been broken or unrealized. And what does that look like? And like I said in the beginning, I think it's all like deep in an issue of dignity. Uh, right before I kind of like backed up in June, I put a post on Instagram saying, um, hey, this, like, the things that ha that um, have happened was Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, uh, this, like, focus in on white supremacy, this, these are dignity issues. And if you can't see that they're dignity issues, that's the problem. Um, and so the unity focused, the unity oriented peacemaking is really about that. Yes, I want to address and look at and help people process and work through what will justice and equality and dismantling white supremacy and dismantling this like. But I also want to go beyond that to a place of what does it look like for us to be unified, to be reconciled to each other, to operate in a space where it's not flipped, right? I'm not looking for white people to be oppressed because that's also not helpful and it's not honoring dignity. Um, what, what, I, what I want to encourage people towards is that as we work through this hard process of racial equality, dismantling white supremacy, and dismantling the existence of racism in the world, especially around this concept of like anti-blackness, that there is a space we can get to if we keep going beyond that, where we actually live in a, in, in relationship that really embodies a unification um, not perfection, not a utopia, but where we're able to really at our core care about one another in a way where dignity is primary in the way that we engage with each other and that we insist on the dignity of my neighbor. And so it's not about, are we done yet? We did the protest and we did this up. Is that enough? It's, it's not enough until we can come together and in our differences, still be able to operate as one another and not either or. We're othering 
each other is not an option. Like that's not, that's not the norm. The norm is not othering each other. Uh, the norm is, uh, is sitting at the table together, listening to one another's stories and not trying to prove a point, but just trying to learn and connect and understand. That's the norm. Right now, that's not the norm. Right now, that's like, ooh, you do that, that's, that's amazing. And I'm like, this is what we should be doing anyway. Because at the end of the day, there's a common humanity. And when we live in the common humanity and look at our differences, not as places of division, places of curiosity and beauty and learning, then we're moving a space where we can uh, be oriented towards unity in our peacemaking and not only because we do need the equality and the justice and the dismantling of what's been built. But what we build, after we've dismantled it and built something new, Austin and Brown said that, dismantle it and build something new. The something new looks like us honoring the common humanity we all share primarily and then moving in our relationships in light of that. Yeah, beautiful. Sorry, who did you just reference? What was the name? Ann Brown. <sighs> um, yeah, uh, okay, I wanted to riff on, I've heard people you say this word, let's double click on that. Uh, <laughs> in the whole, yeah. Oh, man. That's uh, yeah, that is, okay, so I, I'm really interested in, there's um, a, a string of stories I read a long time ago that profoundly changed me. I was still not well psychologically and I was still quite stuck in substances but one of the pictures the author paints is kind of it, it's sort of this paradox perhaps of like old minds think how do we stop bad things from happening and new minds think how do we create what we want um and so in terms of this it's so Okay, because I get a bit, like I understand my own thought process in this and because like, I was very much like, how do we, and I know the systems in a sense are slightly more complicated in the US than they might be here, but like kind of it's a global thing too in some ways. And, and you mentioned it too before, because a lot of it is, it's class and, and economic and that and then because of the income inequalities that are more represented by minority groups it disproportionately affects minority groups um so how do we like and then it becomes in a sense then that is a reflection of like systemic oppression or something like that and so how do we like how do we create what doesn't exist without this because i do i do think there's some sort of unhelpful hyper focus on like dismantling what exists rather because if we just tear all this shit up and i don't mean like the prejudicial systems that are overtly like destructive but like, how do we like maintain somewhat of the quality of what exists while creating, like, am I making sense? Like we can't just rip apart our government and economic system, right? Which manifests in oppression and racism and all these other things, you know? So like, we can't, it's not that simple, right? Like. Right. I don't know. I, I'm do just you, trying to think out loud. Like, yeah, it, it's yeah. I, I'm yeah. following you. Like, how do you yeah. dismantle it and not destroy everybody's life in the process? Right. 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 Like, yeah. 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 Where people yeah, yeah, are yeah. like, <laughs> you know, I I can't. I remember reading this in school a thousand years ago, and it struck me. And I don't even remember what it was about, but it was something where like 
whatever the, and it was fairly recent, like it was in the last like hundred years or so, some empire had collapsed in like, because like there was this uprising and this overthrow and money was so inconsequential that if there was a basket of money, people would dump the money out, take the basket because the money was worth less than the, like a wicker basket, yes, you know? So yes, yes, yes. I'm like, oh, that's, that doesn't sound great. You know, that's, right. that's not what we want. My first answer is I don't actually know because I'm not an economist and I'm not yeah, like there's, I think yeah. there's people who think about these complex right. things right. in the work that I do do. What, what my first response is relationships are going to fuel the revolution. Mm. So how do we dismantle what exists and not, you know, it's like make it, abysmal for everybody for the rest of the generation because we you know right. turn everything out. Right. I don't have a good answer for that. I don't know what the answer would be, but I do know that whatever that answer is, really the way that it's going to happen is in relationship. The way that society actually changes is when the relationships that we as individuals have ha are changing and they become important enough to say, oh, I'm going to now me who maybe I'm part of the majority, maybe I have privilege in a certain area. This this issue doesn't affect me, but in my relationships, I have now built relationships with people in a space of uh, wanting equality and in a space where I'm trying to operate as an anti-racist or whatever you want to, however you want to qualify yeah. those things. Yeah. I'm trying to operate in a way where, again, I'm honoring the dignity of the people in my relationship. And as I diversify what my reality looks like, I see what their reality is and I really care about these people and I and I can't personally solve all their problems, but what can I do with what I have? I have a voice or I have I have um, economic power, I have political power, I have I have these resources and so I'm now going to move because of the relationships, I'm gonna move in these spaces that will eventually change society. And I think like if I'm thinking about how to move in a way where we are dismantling it and building something new, that's for me what it looks like. It's about mm -hmm. how do mm -hmm. I do something? How, how does the revolution happen in my life? And if I say it's relationships, then if you don't have political power and you feel like you don't really have a space of privilege or whatever, you everybody has relationships. And if that is what fuels a revolution, then everybody has a part to play so that the dismantling happens. And what's built is something that really honors uh, the dignity of all the people involved. I, I don't, I honestly can't say if you can do that without like everything crumbling. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. be the person to answer that, but yeah, I, no, me neither. <laughs> you know, so yeah, but yeah. it's a real question. Like, it's, it is. is is the end of this process currently? Like, is the other side of this look like destitution for the country? I, I hope not, because I don't think that's people's goal. Um, but it's so in America. It is literally the way the country was built and set up. So I, I don't know if there's a way to do it and bypass some some devastation. I, yeah. I don't know what they will yeah. do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that was came up. Um, oh, yeah, I think, well, like I know, um, what is it? What do they call it? Justice reform, or or like the way the jails and the whole police, like yeah, um, uh, there's uh, incarceration. Yes, something to do with about. the jails. Yeah, okay. Yeah, there's prison um, reform. Ah, um, is that what it is? Right. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, because so what? When I think about what, what I think is another unspoken reality of the current discontent i guess you could say is is this sort of like unfairness of the system if you will right like the like i was trying to explain to my kids somehow like 
basically in America, if you have money, the laws don't apply to you the same way they apply to someone who doesn't have money. Um, and that's kind of true here too. Um, and so like, because again, that disproportionately affects minority groups who are disproportionately uh, like unequal economically, then that is again, that's like the, as I see it, the sort of systemic oppression part of it or the systemic racism. And so it just, it, 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 it is such a violation of our human dignity, you know, that like after the economic collapse of 2008, it's like all these fucking people that tore this system, brought it to its knees, didn't face any consequences, right? Like, and it's just so enraging, you know? And then it goes on and it just goes on and it just goes on. And like, and so I wonder. Well, and if I can, I'm sorry. Um, the other side of that is when everybody lost homes, a lot of them got bought by developers who had cash. cash. I don't have a bunch of money to buy a bunch of houses, even if they're at like a steal. I don't have thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, but um, development companies who are disproportionately owned by white people yeah, yeah. bought all stuff. And I'm simplifying it. I'm not expert in the area. But eventually, a bunch of those bought by development companies. And what is now happening is a mass gentrification. And what happens during gentrification is that minority groups, a lot of typically low income, a lot of black people are yeah. being out of their spaces because somebody bought whatever and they're now developing so they can build towns and sell them at half a million dollars. No one who lived in those days before can afford it. It is, I mean, the complexity of how racism is intertwined in the way the systems in America are built is mind boggling. Yeah. Which I can speak to it very lightly on the surface, but there are people who this is their bread and butter and they know and understand. I don't think my heart take that level of knowledge because it is just, egregiously grieving to think yeah. about the, the space that you know the box that's been painted around people of color specifically people yeah 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 and it's not really my my area of expertise either so but like it kind of what i think you know, maybe people doing similar work to us, like we have a place in help, helping to maybe humanize the solutions or at least the dialogue around it, right? It's, yeah. there's something deeply missing there. And, and the, the, I love just this sort of, yeah, the idea of, of dignity and like, we can't other, it's like, how do you honor all the othering that happens and has happened to egregious levels and also not use that in the solutions? You know, it's so like, yeah. fuck, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's hard. And I yeah. like, first of all, dignity is not my idea, right? No like, doubt. No I, doubt. Yeah. I came to that space and that word and definition after a process that I went through and after learning from a lot of people, I would definitely throw, um, I, I would throw a lot of thanks to Brene Brown because she helped me put words around things that I, that I was thinking about. Um, the social emotional learning movement in the States, which is really championed by a group called Castle. Like these are, this is where like at the stuff that's been in my head has been able to be sorted out. But I really believe that when we talk about how do we not other, right? How do we not just flip the oppression, say, see, 
And Oshita Moore, who is, she's amazing in work. She's talked about like, that might feel good in the moment to be like, ha, now I'm on top because you've been not on top for so long. But at the end of the day, that's not really, is that really the goal? Is the goal really to just oppress somebody else? Because then you're no better and you're not doing anything better for the common humanity than the person who is oppressing you, which is why I focus on unity oriented peacemaking because then we're talking about how do we all honor each other's humanity and not try to make everybody the same, which we, you know, we can think about things like colonization, which is like, I'm gonna come take over this place and then make you also look and act and think like us. Yeah. How do we not do that and kind of carry that thought process, which I think is very closely tied to white supremacy how do we do that and still and honor our common community and come to the table together and enjoy each other's company <laughs> and enjoy the dialogue and break bread together and say, yeah, you, I honor you as my neighbor, as my sibling in, in, in this human family. Um, and it is hard because in the midst of that, there's been a lot of hurt and there's a lot of people who feel like they're being forced to sit at the table. They don't even know if they want to be there. And you're, and you feel like, I think there are people in the black community who definitely feel like I am begging you to see my dignity. Why do I have to fight for this? And why are you arguing with me about it? Why are you like, why is your response something that says, no, no, we're still not going to honor your dignity. What else do I have to say? What else do you have to see? What else do you have to learn so that you can just say like the signs that were held up during the civil rights movement, I am a man. Like not, not, you know, a partial human, I'm a whole human. And we're still fighting that same fight and having the same conversation in 2020. It's complicated and it's not easy and it's very nuanced and it's a lot of patience, it's seed planting and a lot of okra. <laughs> and, um, but in the midst of all of that, he, like, I encourage me for people who are like, man, I'm, it's hard. I don't know. Is it fit? Yeah, because don't forget about a fruit tree. Don't forget about, you know, the, you know, turning around. And I remember taking, pulling an apple off of a tree and biting into it and being like, I have never tasted an apple like this this is amazing and when I would have to go out and do the work to get the garden ready for the beans and the other stuff that was starting to come up that was like my treat I would go over to the fruit tree and be like well I'm gonna give me some apples today because if nothing else works out those apples <laughs> that's good you know so we have to find those places of joy and encouragement and and I think that does look like rest and play and being creative in the midst of doing the work um I think it's all, it's integrated. You have to do all it for us to keep going and for us to create a world where our children are going to grow up in a different society and being seen, honored differently than we currently are right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wow, okay. It's almost been two hours. It's crazy. I know. Um, and I couldn't keep stuff. talking to you. That's what's funny. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Yeah, I yeah, totally. Yeah. I want to get a snack and just keep going. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, my gosh. Um, well, we should again, for sure. Um, Please. I would love to yeah. know that. No doubt. Um, okay. So all the, like, all your personal information and your... Uh, professional information whatever it is that you send me will be included like in the in all the information in the podcast so but if you want to say any sort of lasting words um please do uh, lasting words <laughs> yeah or, um, or just a goodbye whatever yeah yeah, yeah. um <laughs> any anybody who's listening who's trying to figure out either for themselves um, or for how they move in their community and in this new world that we're trying to create. 
I would encourage you to always keep in your view your divinity, as you said. And um, I'm sure this exists in other faiths and thoughts, but in the Christian faith, we call it Imago Dei, uh, which means we are image bearers of, we bear God's image, we bear a, a piece of the divine. And that is always true. That is always true about you. It is always true about your neighbor. And it is always true about your enemy. Even when we don't live into that reality, it is always true. I don't want to open my mouth. Yeah, I just like <laughs> cut. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, it was thanks. good. It was yeah. good. It's always no good. Doubt.